So now what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the, the program design and implementation of uh, Section 108 uh, projects. Basically, we get applications that have uh, either a specific project identified and the design then focuses on that individual project. It prov the application has to provide the detail and specificity that we need in order to determine whether the, the project is eligible, meets national objectives, requirements, and so forth, and also whether uh, it will meet our underwriting standards. And then, after we have approved an application, uh, the guaranteed loan would be dispersed for that particular project uh, as a borrower needs those funds to carry out that project. Another way that uh, applications can be submitted is by uh, designing a loan pool. And what this means is that the application describes uh, in a generic fashion the, uh, the activities that are going to be carried out, the kinds of activities, how you will establish the guidelines and, and rules that you'll follow in selecting activities to be carried out and uh, how it will meet our national objectives, requirements, and public benefit standards. Uh, the individual transaction uh, don't have to be identified, although in some cases they are. Some of, the, some of the transactions are already known and will be carried out. But we prefer that the, uh, the, the loan pool applications only be submitted after the, uh, the recipient and the applicant has identified some projects to be, that it wishes to carry out. Um, in any event, after when you are ready to carry out an activity under one of these loan pool projects, uh, you will have to submit to the field office having jurisdiction for the CDBG program information about how the, the activity will meet a national objective and other program requirements and get a determination of program compliance before we and headquarters will begin uh, the process for providing financing for that particular activity. In connection with all of our loans, uh, we are beginning uh, want to emphasize the underwriting function. Uh, and this is becoming more important as uh, we're finding out the, uh, there are too many situations where uh, loans were not adequately underwritten and, and projects have not produced the kind of payback that uh, was expected. So we want our, our borrowers to go through a process, an underwriting process, that identifies the risk associated with a particular loan, that establishes the loan terms and conditions that will, design, uh, will be designed to mitigate those risks, and then proceed with a project only after the underwriting has been completed. Next slide. Remember that the underwriting uh, process has to occur for each and every loan. It's not just a matter of having establishing underwriting guidelines for a portfolio. You have to apply those to each and every loan. Some loans are going to be riskier than others if you're carrying out a loan pool project. And if you're doing that, uh, you really have to weight the portfolio so that there's a balance of, of uh, larger or solid loans and smaller loans or less uh, more risky loans so that they offset each other. That's one of the advantages of having a loan pool project. You can uh, establish a portfolio, diversify the portfolio so that the, the risk of one project is balanced by, the, uh, by other projects that are less likely to be, uh, to be problems. Uh, you may want to carry out a, a riskier loan that, because it has a greater value to you, to the community. It will, it will provide a, a potential payback that will be worth taking that risk. But if you do, you have to find a way to mitigate that risk and uh, demonstrate to HUD that if you want to fund it with Section 108, that the loan will, will still be, uh, Section 108 loan will still be paid back. Next slide. So these are the basic considerations. And we're not going to go into a great detail on underwriting here because uh, one of the things that we want to 
talk about a little bit later on uh, some of the products that we're going to roll out uh, for technical assistance purposes. And one of those will be uh, an underwriting, uh, another webinar that will focus on underwriting. And we're also going to provide some uh, underwriting guidelines and manuals to be posted on our website. But uh, these are the basic considerations. You want to make sure that the project is feasible. Do you have site control, for example? Can you, uh, can a developer, if it's a third-party project, can a developer build what the developer wants to build where they want to build it? Uh, we look at financial feasibility. You want to make sure that there are enough committed sources of funds to cover all of the uh, cost of the project and that the individual activity will generate a sufficient cash flow to, to repay the loan. You also want to look in connection with the whole process. You want to look at the market feasibility, uh, make sure that there's a, a demand for the, uh, for the activity that's going to, be, going to be carried out. Then you want to look at the management capacity, uh, both for you as the recipient and your ability to manage the loan, but really focus on the skills and experiences of, of the experience of the borrowers, the third-party borrowers, to manage the project and make sure that it gets carried out as uh, intended. And lastly, we want to look at uh, collateral in case the cash flow from the project isn't sufficient. And the collateral can be uh, of many types, as, as we'll get into a little bit later, but uh, basically you want to make sure that if the cash flow can't uh, repay the Section 108 loan, that the collateral will be there to do that. Pointing out, I would also like to point out that HUD has established guidelines in addition to the ones we'll be talking about later, uh, guidelines for uh, evaluating and selecting economic development projects, and they're uh, an Appendix A of our regulations, uh, at, uh, and they're referenced in 570.209 of the Public Benefit Regulations. Next slide, please. So the guidelines that I talked about that we're going to make available will be broken down into two types of uh, loans. One will be uh, focused on real estate loans. These are the de big development projects, apartment buildings, uh, office buildings, shopping centers. These are income producing projects and you're looking at that specific project to generate the cash flow that will pay back the loan. And then another category are uh, just simply business loans, for lack of a better term. These are the loans to uh, existing ongoing businesses that will be used for expansion of the business to create more jobs or to provide more needed services. Next slide, please. So with real estate loans, uh, the, the guidelines will be broken down more or less like this. Uh, there will be a You'll need to do a borrower evaluation. You want to know that the borrower, the third-party borrower who comes to you is a, a sound credit. You want to know that they have good character. You want to know that they're credit worthy. You're going to check uh, their experience uh, in carrying out uh, similar types of project. Do they have the capacity to do that? These kinds of things. Then you're going to do a market analysis of the property. You're going to do a property appraisal, and then you're going to determine whether the pro uh, what the status of the project is. Is it ready to go? Do you have all of the funding sources in place? Do you have site control? Uh, do you have everything in place, uh, the zoning requirements met? Do you have everything in place to be able to carry out the project? Uh, then you'll do a f project financial analysis. Uh, you will develop uh, pro forma uh, financial statements, looking at uh, sources, various sources. You'll focus on uh, the appraisal will be one source, other kinds of, uh, uh, of information. You'll have other types of sources available to you that you'll look to to uh, determine whether or not the uh, project itself uh, will generate a sufficient cash flow to pay back the loan. And then finally, again, you're going to do the collateral analysis making sure that uh, you have the type of collateral that you need, whether usually for these kinds of projects that is a lien on property, but you can also supplement that with other types of collateral such as personal or corporate guarantees. Uh, and 
Another thing to keep in mind is oftentimes these projects, and usually they do, have uh, multiple sources of financing. And one of the aspects of that is that most often you're going to have some form of agreement among all of the lenders, inter-creditor agreements, what is commonly termed. You need to look at those kinds of agreements very carefully to make sure that your interests are adequately protected. Next slide. For business loans, again, you're doing uh, you're not just looking at an individual property for the payback. You're looking to the ongoing business operation to be able to pay back. But still, you're going to do the basics. You're going to do the borrower evaluation. Make sure that you have a creditworthy borrower. You're going to look at credit reports. You're going to, uh, again, look to see that, make an evaluation as to whether the team that's operating this business is capable of carrying out the kind of improvement that they want to finance with the Section 108 loan. You're going to look again at the, uh, the industry, the market. Uh, is there a demand? If they're forecasting, uh, if the purpose is to expand operations, is there a demand for those op uh, whatever the goods or services that are being produced by this business? And again, you're going to do the basic financial statement analysis. You're going to look at the uh, sources and uses funds. You'll look at the balance sheet of the borrower. You're going to look at the, uh, the income statement of the borrower to make sure that they have the ability to not only pay you back, but to meet all of their uh, uh, business expenses and generate an additional cash flow sufficient to repay the Section 108 loan. And that gets to this the cash flow as well. You're going to make sure that everything that you do uh, is oriented towards uh, cash flow. Can the business generate uh, sufficient cash flow from its operations to pay back the Section 108 loan? And then we'll always end with a collateral analysis the same way that you do with real estate loans. What's going to secure this loan if the cash flow is not there? Do we have personal guarantees? Does the owner or the owner, do the owners uh, uh, have sufficient uh, uh, resources and assets to issue personal guarantees? Is there, a, uh, is there another corporation involved that might uh, be in a position to provide a corporate guarantee? So uh, with that, uh, we're going to talk about some program examples and Great. Thank, thank you, Paul. We're going to look at two different examples. And what the two examples we're featuring are Memphis, Tennessee, which is a borrower that's been participating in the program since 1994 and mainly uses the program as a gap financing resource for specific real estate development projects, as Paul mentioned. And then we're also going to discuss a newer borrower, which is St. Louis County, Missouri, and hear from Jeremy Newberg, who is actually from Capital Access and working there with the county as they set up their loan pool program. So we're going to launch a video from Memphis first. Good afternoon. I'm Debbie Singleton, and I'm the Deputy Director of the City of Memphis Division of Housing and Community Development. And Memphis has been a longtime participant in HUD Section 108 program, and I'm really excited to give you all a little bit of information about our projects that we've done and how Memphis uses the 108 program to focus on projects that we would not normally be able to finance without it. So um, we're going to look at the program in an uh, overview for Memphis. And right now, um, you're looking at a screen that shows that we have been a participant in the program since 1994. When I first came to the, Memphis, uh, to the city of Memphis in 1995, we had just closed on our first 108. Uh, we currently have an outstanding principal balance to HUD of $24,830,000. And we're actually in the process of applying for our eight Section 108 loan, and that's for the Midtown Market at Union and McLean. Memphis always uses its Section 108 uh, program funds to finance development anchors that will spur private investment. We usually look for projects where uh, there's been no movement, there have been uh, buildings that have been vacant for a number of years, and we try to focus our funds on those anchor projects that will spur other private development in the area. Uh, our, I guess our most recent uh, project to be completed is the Bath Brothers of Memphis Pyramid, and I hope you all have the opportunity to come in Mem to Memphis and visit uh, 
the pyramid. Um, it was, used to be a sports arena. It was a basketball arena that was um, built for the local university of Memphis. And when it closed down, uh, it sat empty for a really long time. The city of Memphis has partnered with Bath Pro Shops, and we have put one of the largest retail stores in the world into our pyramid. It includes um, shopping for a Bath Pro store, um, a hotel, restaurant, a bowling alley, an archery and gun range, and an outdoor observation deck at its apex. Um, it is probably the most uh, well-done man cave on the planet. Um, it, you would be totally impressed that this used to be a, a, a basketball arena. Uh, and it is probably one of our most successful um, Section 108 projects. We looked at pairing our money with a state program called the Tourism Development Zone uh, and Convention Center Financing Act, uh, whereby the state of Tennessee partners with the local jurisdiction and uh, create a sales tax TIF. The sales taxes that are produced within a described zone, uh, the incremental increase in those sales taxes is pledged toward the debt. So you can see here we, we were able to finance $105 million with a very small investment from um, the, the 108 and the Betty Grant to pair with the, the sales tax proceeds from the Tourism Development Zone. Whenever we do due diligence for 108 projects, there's, there will be, we'll look at financial resources, we will look at um, the benefits that come back to the city, and to decide how much of a commitment the city needs to make this project happen, how important it is to the city. And for uh, the, what, the pyramid project, there were so many great benefits that the city was going to get out of this project. That's why we really felt strongly about making this commitment to this project and to our partner, Bath Pro Shops. So we uh, estimated that there would be 576 uh, permanent jobs with at least 51% of those available to LMI persons. And that resulted in an estimated $7.6 million in new annual wages. The construction jobs, were, which was a, a great opportunity for us to include local uh, and minority vendors, uh, created 1,665 short-term construction jobs. And we estimated there would be $36 million in new sales and hotel motel taxes. The last bullet point says there are 800 plus new visitors to Memphis. That was our estimate when we first uh, closed the project. And in December of this year, the project opened, the grand opening was in April of 2015, and by December of 2015, we had already had 2 million visitors. So you can see that you know, with the right project, the right partners, the right funding streams, um, these projects can make a huge difference to a city. Four Square Center was what was a project that we did not too long ago that was the redevelopment of three historic buildings that were located on a uh, downtown park, which is called Court Square. It was a former Lowenstein department store building that was built in the early 20s. Um, the Court Square Annex warehouse, which was just adjacent to that, and the Lincoln American Tower, which was really the first um, skyscraper that was built in Memphis. Uh, they had been vacant for over 20 years, and the city felt like this investment on Court Square Park would uh, provide the city with an anchor that would create other private development around it. So we developed those three buildings into 74 market rate housing units with over 50,000 square feet of commercial space in the downtown area. It took a whole lot of different uh, sources of revenue for Court Square Center, and I think you see the, for some projects that you, you have to go to every pot of money you can possibly come up with. We had historic tax credits, we had new markets tax credits, we had private debt, and then we had the Betty and the 108. Uh, at the point of time that we closed construction, the budget was about $40 million. Elsewhere in the city, as we were in construction, elsewhere in the city, there was a fire downtown that actually damaged these buildings. And with those insurance proceeds, we actually got to expand the project. And the project um, budget expanded to about $53 million. So we ended up having to actually rebuild totally the annex, 
which was totally destroyed by the fire. So in this case, we really ended up with more of a leverage than we started out with. Crosstown Development is one of our projects um, that it closed last, and we are under construction. This building that you see on the right is a was formerly a Sears Roebuck distribution center that was built in 1927. There were about 13 of those buildings that were built across the country. They largely look the same. Um, this particular building has been uh, vacant since 1993. We met with several different groups that wanted to redevelop this building, but the size of the building was always a challenge. And it was, as it was originally built, and with some extensions that were done over time. It, it's, we started out with about a million and a half square feet. So we always thought that the, in order to get the right development team together, it would take a number of partners to be able to do that, just to be able to address the size and scope of the building. So um, the last group that came and met with us, the Crosstown Arts Group, uh, brought nine founding partners with them. They are addressing uh, health care, they're addressing education, they're addressing housing, and they have a commercial component too. So there are a large number of uh, medical hospitals and doctors and health care professionals are joining into this building and taking up space so that it becomes this, this medical mecca. And then a number of the universities are partnering to provide student housing, and there's even discussion now about creating a school space on the actual site. Um, the redevelopment began in 2014. It's currently in progress, and it is a sight to behold. Just like the other projects, we were looking for economic impact for the Crosstown project. Uh, because the building had been empty so long, and because it was such a vibrant part of the city when it was it, when it was open, we wanted to try to bring back not only that building but the surrounding area. So the 865 jobs you see will be new jobs that are created, along with about 1,700 jobs that will be moving to the site that currently exists. The 997 new construction jobs resulting in that $50 million in annual construction wages makes a huge difference to the city as far as um, it, the, the wages that are earned within the city limits. It also created 1,500, over 1,500 new indirect jobs, and it gave us those sales tax benefits over time that became part of this revenue stream that now comes back to the city. Because of the size of the building, you would expect that the size of the construction project would also be large, and it was. And so we looked to those same different um, sources of funding, and we were extremely fortunate to be able to have a huge number of partners to come in on this project in order for us to be able to um, leverage our Betty and 108 funds to come up with this $207 million. This is where we were right at about closing. Because of market conditions, we ended up at about between $198, $200 million on the project. But it, we were lucky that we have a lot of private equity. Historic tax credits and new markets tax credits were also av available. We had private debt and the Betty and the 108. Also, the city and the county and the state came in with several different uh, programs and sources of funds in order to top out to that $207 million. Um, when we're doing our underwriting, if you look at the private debt side on all of these projects, uh, except for the pyramid because we own that project that we are the owner, we are coming in to make these projects happen, and but for these federal investments, this, these projects would not happen. Our money is used to make sure that the private debt is reasonable that the lenders feel that, that the debt coverage ratio is reasonable, and that we have, we have sized the debt to the, to the future revenue streams of the project that make the project a long-term viable project. So in summary, for us, for the city of Memphis, HUD has always been one of our strongest economic uh, development tools for our division and for our city. We always believe that if we measure the risk, we understand the risk that the private side is taking, then that, that helps us decide how we can assume some of that risk on the public side to make sure that these projects are viable at the point when they close their financing and they're viable for long term. So we create this public-private partnership that remains in effect for the life of the project. We want to make sure that 
10 years down the road if there's an issue that we can come in and step in and help them uh, solve those problems and to make sure that those benefits that we expected to see long term are there and to make sure that the, the citizens that we're serving are best uh, served. So in closing, um, for the city of Memphis, I want to thank HUD, number one. If it were not for HUD, if it were not for our great partners in Region 4 in Knoxville, because I think you will, you will learn that the 108 is a tool that you just can't do without. And I look forward to talking to all of you about your future projects. Thanks. Bye from Memphis. Okay, it's all, all yours, Jeremy. Good afternoon. St. Louis County. HUD 108 program serves the entirety of St. Louis County. The county applied and received approval for a HUD 108 loan guarantee for 24 million in borrowing capacity. It is for the entire St. Louis County with an emphasis on the North County communities that include Ferguson, Wellston, Florissant, Pagedale, Normandy, uh, and these counties are included in the HUD Promise Zone as well, which is a coordinated community economic development organizing effort. In the application, the county applied for 108 financing to do transit-oriented development, to do mixed-use commercial and retail, business development loans, infrastructure and public facilities. This reflected their strategic plan. Um, and it's an exciting opportunity because with St. Louis County in the northern communities, you have classic post-industrial communities that when heavy industry was up and running, many people transitioned from lower income to moderate middle income lifestyles with prosperous employment. As the jobs faded, incomes in these communities went down and it led to some challenges. So the theme for the 108 program in St. Louis County is how to cultivate a healthier market to um, improve quality of life for residents and businesses. Uh, the key word there is cultivate a market. So what type of loans make sense? There is a need for infrastructure improvements with the real estate, there's a clear focus on transportation-oriented design, a wonderful public transit system with Bi-State that has been moving light rail, investing in light rail, uh, but there's clearly a need to also better connect the bus system with the rail system. And then the businesses in the community as well as the people. Next slide. So some challenges with real estate development specifically is you have these older shopping centers and malls Many of them have closed, um, and it presents some blights. So what do you do with them in terms of redevelopment? Again, I mentioned before, public transit is growing, and it's very well run, but there's a need for better linkages with the different modes of transportation, particularly in the North County communities. And then the housing stock is aging. Next slide. For business lending, this is going to be a challenge. You had, after the civil disturbances in Ferguson, a concentrated effort for relief funding that provided capital to over 80 businesses, but they were relatively lower dollar loans and, and effective. But now we're in a recovery mode where the vision is how to grow the capital base of the community. So there are issues of owner capacity. There are issues where you have an over-concentration of retail, food, auto repair for a lower income market. And that leads to, well, what type of jobs do we envision for people to be able to raise their families and be able to uh, have a higher quality of life t towards a vision of prosperity? How do we achieve that? Next slide. So the next steps with the county is really to embrace the notion that debt follows equity. Equity follows a good deal. A good deal is defined by having vision, clear demand, financial feasibility, management capacity, grit and persistence. So there's a bridge that we're building. You can't just do the loan right now. We've got to build the bridge of some 
enhancements. So it's enhancing local capacity. The Promise Zone has been impressive, but there are other collective efforts going on amongst the business community, the university and medical communities, and importantly, the government and community organizations themselves. Some CDBG that the county controls will be invested in cultivating businesses, accounting systems, management systems. How to go get a larger contract. To get a larger contract, you need working capital, you're ready for a 108 loan. And then workforce development services. And then finally, focusing on the North County through additional incentives. Um, so this is a more collaborative approach to 108 rather than a one-deal approach, and it's been an honor to work on it. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. We're going to move on now to go over some key and fun program statistics with Jorge Morales, who's one of our loan officers here at HUD. So, Jorge, it's, go for it. Thank you, Bennett. Uh, let's take a look at some of the interesting and telling facts or number about our Section 108 program. Uh, the Section 108 program has made well over 1,900 commitments since 1978, uh, almost 37 years ago. Those commitments represent approximately $9.4 billion. The program manages around $1.7 billion in outstanding loans. As mentioned before, 75% of our commitments are allocated to the economic development activity, resulting in the creation of ret or retention of 119,000 uh, jobs. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this slide represents the geographical distribution of the loan commitments for the five years. Uh, as you can see, the hot regions were used as grouping factor. Uh, as you can see, Region 5 and Region 9 uh, has the largest loan commitments with 33% and 22%. On the other hand, Region 8 holds only 1%. We want uh, all the regions to participate, and there's a lot uh, of opportunity to increase that amount, uh, which means more money for community developments. Uh, so we want all all the regions to take advantage of uh, the Section 108. Let's talk about next slide. One more click. Section 108 funds leverage approximately. $4.62 for each dollar spent on Section 108. Uh, public, local, and state funds, state and federal income tax credits, and other federal programs, those are the public funds. Private, private funds are private local banking, uh, investor equity, developers equity. Next slide, please. We now let's, let's take a look at some of the interesting and noteworthy examples of two activities uh, to emphasize on leverage. Let's uh, take a look at the Section 108 activities adaptive reuse. Uh, the definition of adaptive reuse is the process of reusing an old site or building for a purpose other than which it was built or designed for. Uh, here we have uh, in Burlington, Vermont, the Moran Center, with a Section 108 funds of 2.1 million, it leveraged 13.7 for a leverage ratio of 1 to 6.5. Uh, 6 uh, the project is basically a conversion of former manufacturing plant into an edu educational and recreational site, including sailing, adventure sports, museum, and other amenities. Next slide, please. The next project is the uh, hotel, hotel, hotels development or redevelopment. Uh, in this example, we have the Reading Double Three Hotel in Pennsylvania, uh, which uses Section 108 funds of 1.7, and it leveraged 62.3 million. This project in Reading, uh, Reading, excuse me, uh, projected to create 176 jobs. The next project is the Northern Hotel in Green, Green Bay, Wisconsin. 
uh, takes 4.7 million Section 108 funds and leverage 39.8. And this is for the redevelopment of a building on a national register into a hotel in a high poverty area. Thank you so much, Jorge. We really appreciate that. It's exciting to see how much Section 108 dollars can leverage. And now I'm passing it to another loan officer, Shaidat Abbas, who's going to tell us about how to apply for a Section 108 loan guarantee. Good afternoon, everyone. So we've covered the overview of the 108 program along with the, why, with the why and how it can be used. This slide shows the four entities that can directly apply for 108 financing. The first are those entitlement recipients that receive CDBG block grants. Secondly, states can also apply on behalf of non-entitlement communities that they can distribute the funds to. The third box, the green box, should actually say non-entitlements can apply with state assistance. And last but not least, we have insular areas like Guam, the Virgin Islands, and the American Samoa that can also apply. As a matter of fact, we received our first insular 108 that was approved in 2015 for Guam. Of the state applicants that can apply, the states that can apply, 39 states currently still have 100% of their borrowing capacity still available. So states out there, you have money that you could apply for, please do so. We've noticed that states that do apply for the 108 financing primarily use the monies or a common use is for a loan fund to target specific needs of non-entitlement communities such as the state of Iowa and we have a great quote there for the project manager in Iowa. Is there a next slide? So how much can I actually borrow? Here's an example I'll walk through. If I'm a community and I receive $3 million in annual CDBG allocation, my borrowing capacity, my maximum borrowing capacity is going to be five times that or $15 million. From that amount, I'm going to subtract my outstanding 108 loan commitments and also subtract my outstanding 108 loan balance. In this case, it's 800000 and $2 million respectively, leaving me with an available borrowing capacity of $12.2 million. Now, we don't have the borrowing capacity for each of our communities on our website currently, so if you need help figuring this out, please don't hesitate to contact us. Next slide. So the application process, this is a brief overview of the application process for the such one loan guarantee. First of all, there should be a citizen participation process on the local level, and you should definitely get approval on the local level, either a resolution or a city council meeting. To, talk, to approve the, uh, the application for 108. To prepare your application package, I'll go into that in more detail in a, section, in a second, and then submit to HUD. You may submit concurrently to the field office and to headquarters at the same time to expedite the review, review, review process. Next slide. So this is a brief overview of what the application package should contain. We are going to do a more detailed webinar about this, so this is just a very brief overview. So firstly, the participation comments and the action plan amendment that incorporates the 108 request should be submitted along with a detailed project description. You also want to include project financials, projected is fine, uh, sources and uses, talking about the fi other financing that's in the deal. Absolutely include a description of the collateral as well as an appraisal of the collateral if available at the time. There should be a pledge of your CDBG allocation, a repayment schedule, there's a principal repayment schedule, and should indicate if you want interest only for a while, that is acceptable. And also the source of the repayment of the 108, you should include that as well. The, certifi the certifications are the same CDBG certifications as well as a few Section 108 specific cert certifications. And lastly, you want to include any kind of market study or feasibility analysis that supports the viability of this project. And while we don't want to get a thousand page application, any information, to, the more information you can provide to us, the better. And I'm going to turn over to Bennett to wrap up the presentation. Great, thanks, Shaidat. So just, we, uh, 
wanted to review and the reason we're saying going over application right before wrap up and next steps is we'd like to emphasize that you know right now CDBG entitlement grantees are only using 25 percent of their total available borrowing capacity that means there's almost eight billion dollars in remaining borrowing capacity with entitlement grantees and then for states as Shai Dot uh, also emphasized 93 percent of the borrowing capacity that states have remain unused. That's because states also only could apply as of um, fairly recently, but 93%, so that's about $4.1 billion in remaining borrowing capacity. So what should you do and what should you check out as next steps? So let's go through some of the upcoming materials that have been referenced during our presentation today. So we, uh, HUD, here in headquarters as well as our different f uh, field offices around the country, offer technical assistance as well as we have several um, tools that are not only on our website now but we have several tools that will be posted as part of this whole technical um, assistance initiative that this webinar is part of. So one will help you, we can help you determine whether 108 is the right tool or program to meet your community and economic development needs or the right tool for that project you've been thinking about. We'll, we can walk you through the application process, and as Shai Dot mentioned, we'll be having a webinar as part of the series that will go over that. It's a pre-recorded one, and it will be posted in the upcoming month or two. We also um, are going to give you information on designing and implementing an effective state or local 108 loan guarantee program as part of that application process webinar. And of course, we can always be here of assistance on reporting and ongoing program compliance. And one of the elements that Paul mentioned was we are also putting out a webinar on two different documents that we're putting out on underwriting guidelines. That's for income producing prop projects as well as for business or third party loans. So those are all coming out in the next couple months. Uh, so please be paying attention to our website, or you can also sign up for Section 108 listserv messages, so you'll automatically get emailed about anything that's been posted that's new. And of course, feel free to call us in headquarters or call your local field office. And so now we're going to quickly go through some questions that have rolled in during the course of, of the webinar and during our Q&A session. So and let's get started. So um, one of the questions that came in from the audience was, uh, and I'm going to address this to whoever is closest to the mic, uh, how long does it take to get a Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program application approved? Well, this is Paul Webster. I'll take that one. Um, the process uh, normally takes about uh, four to eight weeks from the date that the application is submitted to HUD until the actual application approval is uh, notification is provided. Sometimes it takes longer than that, and if it does, it's because that the application when it was submitted did not contain all of the information that is necessary to make a determination whether or not the, uh, the activities are eligible, the underwriting is acceptable, and so forth, and when we have to go back to uh, the applicant for that kind of information that can extend the, the processing time. But it is something which we're constantly focusing on, trying to streamline the application process to make it quicker so that uh, if you have a project that's time sensitive, you don't have to wait uh, an extended period. And this is something that uh, one of our objectives is to shorten the time as, as much as possible. And as uh, Shai Dot mentioned, when an application is submitted, if you will submit it both to uh, the field office having jurisdiction for your CDBG program, as well as our office here in Washington, it will expedite the process so that both of us, both offices, can get to work immediately on reviewing the application and uh, trying to determine if there are any uh, issues that need to be dealt with uh, immediately. Thank you, Paul. So we've got another question that's on interest rates, and then, so I'm going to direct this to Hugh Allen, and the question is, how is the interest rate for 108 funds determined? Thank you, Bennett. I briefly touched on this on the diagram, so let me draw your attention back to uh, what we were talking about there. So if you receive financing on an interim basis, you're going to be getting interest at a variable rate, floating rate, and as I mentioned in the uh, uh, earlier slide, that rate is based on the London Bank inter 
uh, excuse me, the Lunter, uh, London Interbank Offering Rate. LIBOR is commonly found. You can find this in all newspapers, and it's based on a three-month LIBOR. So you can check the newspaper and see that. We add a 20 basis points. So if LIBOR is at less than 1%, say 0.62, you add 20 basis points to it, and you get 0.82, you're still less than 1%. And you're paying that interest rate quarterly, February 1st, May 1st, August 1st, and uh, November 1st. Then when you move to public fixed interest rate financing, which only happens when HUD announces a public uh, offering, and we just had one last year, I'll give you just a brief overview of those rates, and they're fixed rates. So the rates there, they're graduated fixed on the amount of uh, uh, principal that's coming in annually, and so they're based against um, treasury obligations of a similar maturity, and there's a little small uh, spread there added to it. So the rates in that public offering went from a low of less than 1% to you get out to year 20, and it was 3.7%. So you're having an all-in rate of a little less probably than uh, 3% on, the, on that. So um, the rates are extremely low. Nationwide, we're in a low-rate environment, but environment. But these are extremely competitive rates, and we people line up to invest in them. Great, thank you, Hugh. Um, let's move on to another question. This is one that I know is on lots of borrowers' minds, especially those who have been using the program for quite a long time. Is how did HUD come up with the new fee? And this must be the FY 2016 fee that, that was mentioned during the presentation, which was 2.58%. So I'm going to direct that to, to Paul Webster. So this is one of the, uh, the main issues that we dealt with in connection with establishing the fee. And basically what we do is we look at uh, the kinds of projects that are undertaken uh, with Section 108 funds, and we try to determine what the riskiness uh, of each category of loan is. And then we weight the average of all loans based on the portfolio, composition of the portfolio. Most of the loans that uh, are economic development in nature uh, are uh, the, the best proxy for those we found uh, would be rates on industrial development bonds. And so we use uh, the rates on industrial development, the default rates on recovery rates on uh, industrial development bonds for that uh, portion of the portfolio. Basically, it's about 75% of the portfolio consists of those kinds of loans. We do have some other types of loans which are uh, more like uh, classic uh, municipal debt uh, non-guaranteed or non-general obligation debt, and there the uh, default rates uh, are somewhat lower, but uh, one of the complicating factors is that we've never had a default on a Section 108 loan that required a payment by HUD under its guarantee. So when you don't have defaults on loans, you don't have uh, history on the individual and the Section 108 program specifically to uh, to fall back on, and when you don't do that, uh, when you don't have that information, you have to use these proxies. The proxy for the, uh, the non-industrial development bond type of loan is a little bit less precise than, even though it's lower, we think it's a little bit less precise. So uh, the result is we, did, we go through a fairly uh, rigorous uh, uh, analysis of the likely default rates, the, like, the years when the defaults are likely to occur, and then we calculate uh, the net present value of, of uh, the default rates minus the recoveries on collateral. That comes out to 2.58% for this year. Great. Thank you, Paul. And we realize we're getting a lot of questions coming in here at the end. As, as we mentioned, we will follow up with you because we'll have your email through registration. We'll follow up with you directly on your question as well as we'll be putting out an FAQ after the webinar as well. Uh, but I do have another one that we have um, ready to go. So one of the questions we got was, how much can I charge my third-party borrower on my spread 
what does a typical spread look like? And I'm going to bring back Corey Schwartz, who's one of our loan officers up here, to respond to the question. Thanks, Bennett. There's no typical spread um, as, the, as the borrower and then as a lender or to a third party. You should charge at least enough to cover your Section 108 borrowing cost. Uh, the interest rate charged to the third party borrower should be pegged to the rate on your Section 108 loan uh, to ensure your ability to repay the loan. You may charge a higher rate at a rate over the Section 108 rate to cover the cost of administering the 108 loan. Uh, you can also use the spread to build a reserve to cover delinquencies. Yeah, this is Paul Webster once again as well. Um, the uh, the spread is is something that the the recipient, the Section 108 recipient, determines, not HUD. But we do, uh, if you're going to pledge that third party loan as collateral for the Section 108 loan, then we do. Uh, require that the interest rate on the third party loan be at least as high as the rate on the section 108 loan. That's why Corey says you, have, you should be pegging the, the rate on the third party loan to the section 108 rates and then add your spread to that. We do encourage some spread uh, where you think the, the project will be able to bear that additional cost to ensure that uh, the, the cost of administering the project uh, uh, that is incurred by the, the recipient uh, can be met from that spread if necessary and also helps particularly for loan pools it helps build a, uh, a reserve in the account to make sure that that is um, paid back. Uh, Paul let me just add to that too one of our uh, active users of section 108 guaranteed financing is the city of Philadelphia who the only type of lending they do is they have a citywide uh, uh, loan pool program and they've uh, lent out about $258 million over the course of, since about 1995 um, uh, and created close to 7,000 jobs and so forth. But the reason I wanted to bring them up is they do take advantage of when a local borrower, a business to whom they're going to lend to, comes in, then they charge a origination fee, and I think there's a little servicing fee in there. So any of you are interested in this, we'd be glad to discuss it with you and link you with Philadelphia to talk to some of their able uh, financing people there to show you how they use it and how they make it take advantage of trying to cover a little of their administrative costs on the individual loans that they're making. Great. Thank you, Hugh. And I know we're we're closing in on our end time, but we're going to probably go through at least one other, maybe two other questions. So the next question that came in was, uh, how soon after my program application is approved do I get access to funds? So I'm going to look at another loan officer of ours and see if Shydot wouldn't mind answering that one. So in terms of how soon can you get access to funds, it really depends on when you as a recipient need financing. A prior approval of your Section 108 application, we will send you commitment documents to execute. And once we get those docu documents back executed from you, and you indicate that you are ready for funding, the loan officer on this side will send you loan documents, a note and contract for you to review with your attorney and if, with ours as well, if need be. And one, then once you have finalized that doc, those documents, send those back to us with an advance request, which we will process, and the funds will be dispersed within the first two, within two weeks if it's an initial request. For a subsequent request, we can get it done within a week. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. So I think we have time for one more. So we're, we're digging through the many we got, and we're gonna, I'm going to let Huge choose which one we, we deal with now. I'm just going to ask to answer a question that came up that doesn't uh, respond to a lot of you, but we've had questions about is the uh, Brownsville Economic Development Initiative and the Economic Development Initiative grant programs back? And the answer to that is no. Uh, the Congress has not appropriated any dollars for, uh, for these uh, particular grants, and they're at the time, also at this time, HUD is not asking for any. It did make a good combination, the guaranteed loan with a grant, which helped uh, reduce and minimize some of the risk. Um, but it's not available now, maybe in the future. Great. Thank you, Hugh. 
And just as we wrap up, we wanted to again extend our apologies for the echo that those, some of you have been experiencing on the line. As we noted, we will be posting a recorded version without the echo on the website so you can listen to whomever you might have missed um, at any time. That'll probably go up within the next week or two. Uh, and if you sign up for the listserv, you'll get a notification. So we, again, apologize for that. But thank you so much for joining us today. This, is again, is the first webinar in a series of three uh, on the Section 108 program. And please check out the next ones on the application process as well as on the new underwriting guidelines that we will be releasing. And I'm going to turn it over to Paul Webster if he has any f final words. Thank you, Bennett. And thanks to all of you who have... Uh lasted through this webinar. I uh, realized we tried to cover a lot of uh, material, but uh, one of the things we want to emphasize once again is that uh, this program, while it's not suitable for every situation or every uh, sec uh, CDBG recipient, is a valuable tool that can help a community that is, or a state, that uh, wants to deal with the reduced funding levels by taking by taking advantage of Section 108 to finance the uh, projects that uh, are revenue generating and that can uh, then allow you to preserve your grant funds for other activities that are not revenue generating. So we encourage you to give uh, all of the uh, ideas that we floated today uh, careful thought and Ask us, call our office, uh, get in touch with us, call your, your uh, local CPD representative in the field office if you have any questions or any issues that you want to discuss with us in advance so that we can answer those questions. It's not a competitive program, so we can help you as much as you want to be helped to understand how the program operates. And with that, I want to thank everyone who has contributed to this webinar, including Bennett and the rest of my staff and including our uh, friends from Capital Access who have helped us uh, develop this webinar and who are working on the other two webinars. So I want to thank everyone involved and to thank all of you who have participated. Uh, good evening. Thank you.